the national space policy, UK's national space policy. Now, this has been years in the, in the making, as it were, but it was funny, just before we came on air, Terry was showing me a book uh, by Sir Patrick Moore, who was a, a good friend to both of us um, before his son passing about 10 years ago. And uh, many people may or may not know that the UK did have quite an active space programme in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And the UK has been heavily involved in space pretty much since the dawn of the space age with various operations with satellites and, and development of satellites and instrumentation. Some of the key telescopes, we've talked about the James Webb many times on this show. Um, key instrument on that, the MIRI um, uh, instrument for imaging, uh, is a UK-based instrument, and that's shipping into the James Webb. And a lot of what's happened on the Rosetta spacecraft, for example, the European Space Agency and Mars Express, <coughs> Venus Express, Bepi Colombo, one of the principal instruments on that, um, right now is being run out of the University of Leicester, some good friends, again, involved in that. Um, so the UK's had a massive involvement in space pretty much since the get-go. But in the late 1960s, early 1970s, they kind of extended this into a potential launch program. And the UK is probably the only country on Earth, I can't think of any other, Terry, correct me if I'm wrong here, that's literally launched one rocket and then given up on its entire space program. Uh, that was the launching of the Prospero satellite using the Black Arrow rocket from Woomera in Australia. Um, and literally the, the Harold Wilson government at the time pretty much scrapped the whole thing as soon as that had happened. I mean, they, they literally wanted to scrap it before it happened, but um, it, it literally got kind of appended, as it were. And then people say, well, the UK really doesn't have a space agency or a space program. They do. They've had a massive involvement, not only in the European Space Agency, space agency for many, many years, but uh, like I said, a huge involvement with lots and lots of missions, NASA missions, ESA missions, JAXA missions, um, all over the decades, and lots of collaboration. Obviously, we had Tim Peake, um, very famously quite uh, in the last few years going up to the International Space Station as the first British European Space Agency astronaut and the first one to do an EVA as well, uh, which is interesting. But we're going to talk about some, Terry's going to mention somebody else who, again, it's a name that people may have forgotten. Um, but the first Britain space was a woman. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. But the whole national space policy, this is something that was launched last week. So the national space strategy, this is the government's long term vision for how this small island, the UK, can establish itself as one of the most attractive and innovative space economies in the world. Now, there's some key advantages in the UK's position in that we're an island and essentially we've got nothing um, pretty much to the west of us bar the Atlantic and, and Ireland, obviously, Terry. Um, but Thank north you. of us, yeah, <laughs> north of us, uh, we've got the Faroe Islands, we've got Iceland, etc. So from a launch and range trajectory perspective, as opposed to, say, a lot of the Central European countries. There's Portugal, you know, have got quite a good, you know, possibility there in terms of trajectory. Some of the islands in the Atlantic, like the Azores, etc. Again, they've got good possibilities. But the UK is really pushing towards this launch perspective uh, for the space flight program update. Now, there's some key elements to this. Part of this is also being driven by what's happened with Brexit and the UK obviously coming out of the European Union. We removed ourselves from one of the key projects that we were very, very heavily involved in, which is the Galileo Satellite Programme. Uh, the UK now, in terms of its defence, as a key NATO partner and a key partner in particular to the United States. We're looking at how we can defend ourselves because more and more it's becoming more and more obvious now, especially with the setting up of Space Command in the UK and the Space Force in the United States, that the future of warfare... Um, and it's a horrible thing to even think about, but the future of warfare is going to rely so much on space and space assets. And it won't be probably lasers in space. It won't be the kind of, um, you know, James Bond scenario uh, from Moonraker or anything like that. But it will involve satellites, satellites observing ground you know, assets on the ground to trying to determine what they're doing. We've had this literally since the, the invention of the satellite, this ability to either spy on other company, other countries and nations, or to be able to do things like launch detection. If you watch uh, movies going back to the early 80s, like War Games, for example, which is one of the key films that got most of us into computers and hacking and, and various other things like that. It was predicated on this whole you know computers analyzing satellite data and looking at launch trajectories and that's really really important and the growth of cyber attacks you know we've had in the last day and it was 
potentially just an accident inside the Facebook infrastructure, but Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp going down completely, taking out literally billions of users' uh, ability to communicate and, and do business in many cases. And whilst that's probably not a cyber attack, there have been some huge scale cyber attacks. And with what's happening with Starlink and potentially what's happening with Amazon and various other nations, Chinese and the Russians, moving towards satellite-based infrastructure and satellite-based communications and satellite-based internet, it's going to be more and more important to make sure that these assets up in space are, are really well protected, you know, uh, shored up, defined, um, et cetera, against all of these attacks and, and very much more resilient. So this is part of the whole national space strategy is, you know, you've got the launch aspect where we've got uh, multiple bases up in Scotland. So we've got things like Saxaford up in Shetland, which is one of the uh, key potential launch sites now. Big investment there from uh, the US behemoth, as it were, in the defense industry, Lockheed Martin. Um, you've got the Sutherland Spaceport. You've got Flambeda and Wales, what's happening there, obviously in Cornwall. You've got Presswick up in Scotland as well. And there's some funny, interesting little issues associated with that as well, in that the UK has come out of the European Union, but Scotland is now looking to break away from the United Kingdom, uh, potentially with what Nicola Sturgeon is planning, the first minister in Scotland, and saying that they're going to have a second referendum, etc. So it'd be interesting to follow that, what's happening. But at the moment, it's really focused around the growth in the UK space sector. And it is a huge, huge growth area. They're estimating the, the global space economy is worth hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. And the UK is aiming to get, you know, a, a, smooth, a small percentage of that, but a significant percentage. And it's all part of what the government are planning with upskilling and the integration with artificial intelligence and cybersecurity, all of that. So there's a lot of good in this. There's been some kind of overhyped communication from the government, Galactic Britain and all sorts of nonsense like that, which is just absolutely ridiculous. But it's it's an interesting idea. And you only have to look at the number of jobs in the space sector. And people say, well, I don't work in space. Well, you may do. You may rely on space. You know, people rely on space for communications and rely on it for their GPS in their cars. There's so many areas that you think you may not rely on space, but you actually do. Um, so if you're interested, um, and some of the team that help us uh, produce this show at Space Store, you know, they're very heavily involved in computer science and programming. And that's a key element now in the, the whole of the space sector, being able to program satellites, ground systems, uh, being able to program and test those those kind of uh, systems as well. Um, you know, it's, it's a key thing. So even if you think, oh, space may not be part of my future, you may be wrong. So um, it's an interesting document to read. Uh, it's a lot less heavy than the initial kind of space policy documentation that came out from the UK government about a month ago, which was 800 pages. Uh, this is a lot more lightweight and a lot more kind of user friendly. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to have a look at it, Terry, but it, there's, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, I haven't had time to read it all. I read the titles and the executive summary and so on. Uh, but going back to sort of the, the beginning of what you're talking about, the UK was actually the third country after America and Russia to actually get a satellite in space, the aerial satellite in 1962. We didn't launch it. We got the Americans to do it. But nevertheless, the third country in the world to actually have a satellite in space. So you could say we were off to a good start. And then, as you said, sort of the Wilson government basically scrapped everything they pulled out of the, <laughs> yeah. the program altogether. Uh, an absolute tragedy, although a lot was going on then, uh, quite apart from the launch program and research and satellite development and uh, working on, on um, various programs that were exploring the solar system and uh, space telescopes and um, X-ray and uh, ultraviolet and so on, uh, accessing areas of the, the electromagnetic spectrum that you can't get from Earth. But we don't have until now, we didn't have until now really a proper space launch program. And that's really where the future is. Um, I always have my doubts about Prestwick. I'm not sure exactly what it can be used for apart from a sort of a, a Virgin Galactic type launch where you take off from a that, runway. That, yeah, that's exactly uh, yeah, what they're aiming for. You can't really launch uh, either east or west or north or south from Prestwick. Uh, but yeah, the, the opportunities are there. They're talking about uh, about £16 billion worth um, of, of revenue per year from this. 
uh, at the moment, and 45,000 people are already employed in the space sector, either directly Absolutely. or indirectly. So the, there's room for an awful lot more there. There's various things that people will be aware of. They've probably heard of the Artemis uh, program by NASA to get uh, people back on the moon, will be involved in that. One of the other things that they've mentioned is space weather, which is going to be a very, very critical issue as we come up to the next solar maximum in the next three, four or five years, because that can drastically affect uh, all our communications network, international banking, yep. GPS, aircraft flying, you, you name it, just about anything nowadays has some element of uh, satellite involvement in either messaging or location and so on. So it's good to see them getting involved in that and uh, better late than never. It was interesting as well, touching on that space weather thing, there was a document released by the UK government again in the last few days talking about that and looking at the resilience of space weather. Um, you know, the last major space weather events, as it were, that struck the planet occurred really before the advent of the mass commercialization of space and the satellite infrastructure that's now up there. And um, These small satellites just really aren't designed to cope with these Carrington and greater scale events and they talk about it in the document 1859 and you know mid 1800s you had the Carrington event which was this colossal solar storm that triggered all sorts of havoc with the early telegram system at the time and it's it's just amazing to see that you know is now being taken seriously but still we're throwing up satellite after satellite after satellite that really don't have the levels of resilience that may be needed here we've got an audience question here percentage roughly of satellites is basically uk owned it's a very very small percentage um the ucs database the union of concerned satellites is around about four thousand active satellites now in orbit so if we're talking about active objects in orbit obviously the uk runs and maintains some defense satellites things like skynet 5 soon to be augmented by skynet 6 or replaced by Scanet 6. Um, lots of Earth observation satellites either run predominantly by the UK or hosted by UK companies or managed. So, um, for example, the Harwell um, campus site, they're running a satellite at the moment called IOD GEMS, IOD 1, in-orbit demonstrator, very small satellite designed at Earth observation. That's a key element as well. We talk about climate change as one of the key obviously the the biggest issue that we've got to address as a planet right now if one of these large-scale weather events space weather events were to happen or we had a collision domino effect this kessler syndrome that we've talked about many times on the show we'd lose that capability we'd lose that earth observation capability because most of if not all of the earth observation satellites because of the nature of what they do typically are located in low earth to me medium earth orbit they're not in geostationary orbit that's you know the crowded area that we really don't want these collisions to start happening plus we've got all the defense satellites etc so if you have a look on UCS yeah Union of Concerned Sat uh, Scientists their database it'll give you the exact number but it's it's a smallish percentage largest percentage by a country mile is the United States and as a single operator it's SpaceX again by a country mile they've got you know upwards of 1,700 satellites now uh, up in space and are aiming for anywhere between 20 and 30,000 depending on who you believe and which FCC license application you look at and then China are aiming to put up 13,000 satellites over the coming decades into orbit uh, Russians we don't know what they're doing yet but they're not going to be sitting idly twiddling their thumbs thinking well isn't that great that America and China have got this so it's going to become really congested up there. And the UK wants a piece of this with, you know, things like OneWeb, et cetera. I've always had my kind of, and Terry I know has, the issues with, you know, the pollution of the skies, light pollution in the skies and radio astronomy interference in the skies. So um, it's one of those things that we've got to do something, but we've got to be really sensible about it and cautious. And I'm hoping that, you know, what's happening with the whole UK national infrastructure plan with, with respect to space, does approach this in a sensible and cautious and sustainable manner and that's the key thing here. 